I got, I originally had um, six points, but I'm, I've lengthened it to seven. Um, and it's my Father's Day message, if you will. And I, I'm going to go through all seven of them. And then I'm going to come back and, and camp. The reason I'm going to go through all seven, that will guarantee that I lay the out. You know, you, know, you know what I'm saying. It'll guarantee something, all right? And I've entitled this message. Are you ready for this? You are not a fatherless Job. You're not Job. You can't be Job. Amen? Why can't you be Job? Because people always ask, what about Job? What about Job? Job's in the Bible. You can't be a Job. Well, that, thank you for that thunder silence. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> All right? Why can't you be a Job? You know, when Jesus came, you know one of the big things he was doing, or the main things really that he was doing? Yes, he brought the name of Jesus, fulfilled the word of God, fulfilled the law, all those things. Uh, but you know, one of the things that, big things he was doing was to introduce God as Father to those who would allow him to be. Amen? God as Father. Let me show you that. Let's start with uh, uh, John chapter uh, 14. John chapter 14, and we're going to look at verse... John 14, we'll look at verse 16, I think. And I might go through 18, I'm not sure. Can I have this? I mean, uh, give me... I want 18. Go to 18 and we'll back up. But, and I want it from the New King James, if that's possible. <laughs> Sorry. That's why I want it, from the New King James. Because you're not an orphan. Amen. You're not an orphan. The word, when Jesus said in John 14, 18, from the King James, he said, I will not leave you comfortless. It's the Greek word orphanos. It's where we get our word orphan. And I like that. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Job didn't have a father like you and I have. To Job, God was God, but he wasn't father. Amen? Now, I want you, now, once again, we talk about writing stuff on your heart. Think about this. You're in the family. If you're born again, you're in the family. That's amazing, guys. God is your father. How many good fathers don't take care of their children? Amen? You, you know, sometimes... You have your child and your child can't do any wrong, right? <laughs> if you're smart, you know that kids are, can be kids and our children can do wrong too, right? But a lot of times that's because that's your Johnny or your Sally or whoever, right? But they, we call it why? Because you're a father. But anyhow, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Now back up to verse 16. Jesus said, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. Now, this is where he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Jesus, when he was still physically walking the earth, he had not went to the cross yes, yet, and he said, I'm going to give you another helper, another of the same kind, that he may abide with you forever. Now, stop. What does that mean? Does that mean he checks out when you blow it? Does that mean he checks out when you're not what you should be? See, that's the lie of religion. If you receive condemnation, condemnation is the belief that God is rejecting you. If you receive condemnation, you are doomed to stay stuck in your battle. Amen. You're doomed. I'm going to shock you. This makes religious people go tilt. But I'm going to shock you with this. The blood of Jesus is bigger than any sin you can commit. You keep your faith in the blood of Jesus. Now, that takes some effort because there's a temptation. I mean, I get hard on myself sometimes, but you know what being hard on myself is? Self-righteousness. See, I think it's humility. No, no, it's self-righteousness. Amen? See, that we're talking about the power to come out of sin. God doesn't, Jesus didn't set you free from sin so you could live in it. He wants you out of it. But let me, so I will not leave you Excuse me, I will not leave you orphans. And he says, and here he says, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper. Not a doer, but a helper. That he may abide with you forever. Next verse. The Spirit of truth, referring to the Holy Spirit, whom the world cannot receive. Why can't the world receive the Holy Spirit? Why? Here's why. Because it neither sees him nor knows him. 
They can't believe it because they can't see it. Everything's physical. They can't see it, so they can't believe it. But if you believe it, you'll see it in your life. Amen? Because the world can't receive him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Now, I want you to stop here. Stop. The creator of the universe, God Almighty, lives in you if you're born again. Wow. <laughs> That's heavy duty. It was Kenyon that used to say that the body of Christ needs to be more God inside minded. Everywhere you go, God lives in you. Now, once again, we say that. It sounds great. But what do I believe? How would I, how would I act or operate? or It wouldn't be an act. <laughs> but how would I conduct myself if I really believed? How would I feel if that was really true in my life? That God was in me? How would I feel? Now stop. I'm not going past this. Because we need to see this. How would I feel if, if I really believed that was true in my life? That God was in me? See, the world can't handle this, guys. Amen. Okay, so, so you have a comforter. You know, Job didn't have any comforter. You know that. We'll get to some of this. I want to go through this quick, and then I want, I want to come back. Number one, the reason you cannot be a Job. Anybody know who Job is? Okay. In fact, Job's name, I wrote it down, means the cry of woe. <laughs> That's what his name means. But you can't be a Job, number one. Job had no covenant with God. Now, he knew, he knew of God. Most theologians believe Job's probably the oldest book in the Bible. But you, and somebody say, well, he had a covenant. Well, if you want to, there's nothing that says he had a covenant, okay? But if you want to say that, he certainly didn't have the covenant we have. That's right. Okay? I believe Job didn't have a covenant with God because there's no record of it. You do. You know what a covenant means? You have rights. Now, I'm going to share this with you. When Jesus said, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will do it. John 14, 13 and 14. John 16, 23 and 24. I think it's Matthew 21, 23. Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, etc. When Jesus said that, you know what ask means? It means to ask. It, with no disrespect. But it means to make a demand upon something that's already yours. You're not asked. Here's the difference between the way a lot of Christians ask. They ask out of lack instead of out of abundance. When your children ask you to get something out of the refrigerator, well, most of them don't, right? Why? Because it's theirs. They're not asking for something that you don't have. They're asking for something that's there that's already theirs. See, that's the difference. For example, when the Bible says in James 1, 5, if any of you believers lack wisdom... Let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberty, liberally or freely, and he doesn't upbraid, he's not going to chew you out. Let him ask of God, and he'll receive it. But wait a minute, I thought I already had wisdom. Isn't Jesus becoming a wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption? Yes. But you know, I may not have it in my experience. So when I ask for wisdom, I'm not asking God to give me something I don't have. I'm asking for something that I already have in Christ. See, so you're not, the difference between old covenant asking and new covenant asking is we're not asking out of something we don't have or out of lack. We're asking out of what we already have. We're making a demand or a withdrawal on something that's already ours in Christ. And you know what? That pleases God. <laughs> new wrinkle in the brain. Job didn't have a covenant with God. I'm going to try to come back and talk about this, uh, some of these points, but, but I'm really after something. Because, because, I'll, I'll wait. Number two, that's number one. Number two, Job was ignorant of the devil and his devices. Did you know that? Job was ignorant of the devil and his devices. You know, the whole time Job's three friends, Elipas, Bildad, and Zophar, came to him and were accusing him, and Job was just simply defending himself. He had no idea it was the devil. And in the end, Job repents because God talked. It says, who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? In other words, God says, you guys are all wrong. The younger guy, Elihu, was the only one that really wasn't rebuked. But my point in saying that is Job didn't have knowledge of the devil like we have. They didn't understand that the devil works. 
You know, a lot of that's why the Bible says you don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. He says, you're not wrestling against flesh and blood. It's not people. It's what's behind those people. A lot of things are demonic. We need to go to the source. Take it, tell the devil to shut his mouth. He's a liar. And he'll speak through people just to try to get at you. And if you start arguing with people, you miss the point. That's why when you try to reason with people, it doesn't work. You know why? Because they can't hear you because there is no reason with the devil. There's no reason. You can't reason with the devil. Well, I find this out more and more the longer I go through life. I try to reason with unreasonable people and all of a sudden I realize this is demonic. You can't read. Take authority. This is spiritual. Job didn't have that knowledge. You do. And the Bible says we're not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. Right? 2 Corinthians 2.11. Devices, that which deals with the intellect or literally mind games. Now watch. That's number two. Number three. Job had a very limited knowledge of God. The fact that believers today think they are a Job reveals the same limited knowledge of God. <laughs> the fact that a believer today can think, well, maybe I'm just a Job. You're not a Job. You're a son of a God. I'm, I'm, I'm going through these quick and then I'm going to go back to point one because I got something I'm really going to hammer here. Number four, Job was not a new creation. Job was not a new creation. And, and listen, there's so many scriptures we could go to, go to to say this. The Bible says, therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation or new creature. Old things have passed away. Now, this is a powerful word. Behold or look, all things have become new. How do you look? You look in the word. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. So Job was not a new creation in the way that you and I are. All right. Hang with me. Here's a big one. I do need this verse. Uh, Job 3.25. This is for number five. Number five. I'm going to do seven of them. And then I'm going to come back and, and say something. It's going to get good. Hang on. It's already good. <laughs> number one. Number five. Job lived in fear. Look at this. For the thing I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. That's what was written on Job's heart. Remember we talked about writing things on your heart? And I've used this example. Someone comes to you and they says, hey, have you heard the bird flu's going around or whatever? And then so what do you do? You start thinking about it. You go on, it, on the internet. You look up all the symptoms of the bird flu. You start meditating on it. You start thinking about it. What, what does that do? It can, produces more and more fear in your life. Instead of meditating on Psalm 91, where it says, no plague shall come nigh your dwelling, and seeing yourself in that promise, you're meditating on the bird flu. And then you start seeing, what would it look like with the bird flu in my life? And see, so more and more, you're developing. We're so developed in fear. We're so developed in fear. And what that does is, that's why, go to 1 Peter 5, verse 6. Watch this. We've been here a lot, but this is a good one. Therefore, you can go to the King James if you want. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. How do you do this? Watch this. How do you humble yourself? Casting all your care upon him. Throwing it on him. That's how you humble yourself. Okay? You submit to God's word. Now, it may not feel good. I, you know, Amin. There's Ramin, Amin, and Zarin. Okay, <laughs> they're Persians, but they're Americans now. They're over here. But Amin told me, he said, you know what he's observed about Americans since he's been here? He says, Americans like to get around and brag about their ailments. <laughs> he said, it's like a, a pride thing. He goes, he goes, it's the most amazing thing. He goes, Americans will get around and they will talk. Oh, you got that? Well, I got this and I'm on this. And he says, he said, it's amazing. He says, it's like, it's like you're trying to outdo each other with their ailments and the medications they're on against the ailments. He said, it's amazing. I have seen this. I've, I was around some people. They're not believers. And I sat there and I listened to them talk. I thought, Are you guys talk like this? You can actually feel, you know, when people talk like that and, and start, well, you're getting this age, this and that, and all those things. You know what that does to your heart? That grips your heart with fear. Now, what do you got to do with it? Cast it on the Lord. It's not wrong to have it come at you. 
You can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. <laughs> Sam liked that one. I didn't wonder how many people would get that. But you know, so it comes, but what do you do with it? You cast it on the Lord, right? See, I'm going to say this again. We're all in a fight. It's a fight, guys. It's the good fight of faith. Why is it a good fight? Because the victory's already been won at the cross, but it's still a fight. It's a good fight because the victory's been won, but you still got to fight. And here's how you fight. How do you humble yourself under God's word, under God's hand? How do you do that? You cast all, I love that, amplify. Casting the whole of your care, all your anxieties, all your worries, and your concerns, once and for all, on Him, for He cares for you affectionately, and He cares about you watchfully. In other words, God's looking over you. God's looking over you. Amen? Next verse. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Next verse. Whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that you're not the only one who's going through it. Amen? I paraphrase that. This is what the psalmist said when he, when he said, it's vain for you to rise up early and to stay up late, for so he gives his beloved sleep. What is he talking about? Is it, it you, getting up? Jesus got up early and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. What is he saying? It's vain for you to stay up late worrying about it. And it's vain for you to get up early worrying about it. You cast it on the Lord. Because except the Lord build the house, except the Lord keep the house, that labor is useless. That's what he's talking about. Psalm 127, I believe it is. Amen? He gives his beloved sleep. That's what he's saying. But how do you humble yourself? You cast it upon the Lord. For example, you have a concern. It's a big concern. How would you feel if you was able to get that over on the Lord and not to care about it? How would you feel? Would there be a lightness in your step? Would you be happy? But how do you feel when you hold on to it? See, that's how you can tell, guys. It's a fight. But you cast it on the Lord. Okay? See, Job lived in fear. Then back to Job 3.25. You don't have to live in fear. You know what? Before you go to Job 3.25, go to 2 Corinthians, or 2 Timothy, I'm sorry, 1.7. Most of you know this verse, but I want you to see it. 2 Timothy 1.7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind or a saved brain. Jump over to Romans 8.15. Romans 8.15, watch this. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Again to fear. You haven't received that. You haven't received it. You know the old covenant was based upon you measuring up, which they couldn't even do in the old covenants, which is why they had the animal sacrificial system. But it was based upon fear, right? Right? Rewards, punishment if you didn't fulfill the commands and reward if you did. And they couldn't, so, that, so God gave them the sacrificial system. So even under the old covenant, they couldn't fully keep it. But under the new covenant, you know why you don't have to fear? <sighs> but we have received the spirit of adoption or sonship whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. We have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Job had none of that. We don't have to fear. You know, these kids walk around with no fear. I'm thinking, you liar. <laughs> There's two things that control this world. You know that, fear and greed. Fear is the spirit of this world. Did you know that? It's fear. Everything's fear, fear based, fear this, fear controls people. But God doesn't want us to walk that way. That's why he says God hasn't given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a saved brain. Isn't that awesome? But if, we do, if I choose to hold on to my fears and my anxiety and my worries and not to give them to the Lord, I'm opening a door to the enemy. That's why the Bible says in, the, in 1 Peter 5, 8, he says he, Satan goes about as a roaring lion. He's not a roaring lion, but he goes about as a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. The word devour means to drink down in Greek. 
He's trying to drink people down. He's trying to consume them. He can't, the devil can't come up to you. He, he's so whipped. He can't come up to you and just do stuff. But if you believe wrong, that's where, that's where the torment comes. And that's what, see, the fight. You're, just the very fact that people think they can be a Job in the New Testament and compare themselves to Job. Listen, guys, it's Job or Jesus. Take your pick. I'm going with Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I'm going with Jesus. And he says, I have a covenant with God through his son. And how many know Jesus is perfect? How many know that in him God sees perfection because I'm in him? All right. Now let's, let's go uh, one, uh, two more. Number six, and I want to I go into these a lot more and, and maybe we will. Job had no intercessor. Do you know Job didn't have an intercessor? Do you know you do? You know what an intercessor is? Jesus is at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. You know what that means? He's representing us. Jesus is your representative. How many know that's pretty good? <laughs> Amen? Jesus is your representative. Job didn't have that. And last but not least, Job did not have the baptism in the Holy Ghost and fire. He didn't have that. Hopefully you do. And if you don't, hopefully you receive it. Can I tell you something that sometimes I can just discern things and you can too? And I can discern with that couple that I met when we met on the beach that day. I could just discern. I could just feel it. Nobody had to say anything. They're born again, but they need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I could just feel that. You know, and I, I don't, but, but religion causes you to say, no, that's not for me. We don't believe that way. Who cares how I believe? Like the one lady said to, to the man of God one time, she said, well, there's lots of things in the Bible we don't believe. <laughs> I don't want to be like that. Amen? So Job didn't have that. Now I'm going all the way back to point one, and here's the reason. I knew I'd spend a little bit of time on this. If you are a son, if you are a son, if you are in the family, if you are born again, in fact, let me show you that. Job, or Galatians chapter 4, verse 7. Let me show you this. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. Now stop. This doesn't mean we don't serve. Paul said he was a servant. Romans 1.1. 1, 1. He was a bond servant, a servant of choice. We're serving sons, but we, we're not a servant like we were a slave like we were under the old covenant. That's what he's saying. He's saying your position, everybody say position, is not a servant. Your position is a son. How many know sons have rights that servants don't? Sons have rights to be in, in, in the house with the family, all right? But you're a son. Then, look, this is what really gets me. A lot of people don't see this. Then you're an heir of the things of God through Christ. Notice it doesn't say that. You're not an heir of the things of God. You're an heir of God himself. Can you see that? Isn't that powerful? That includes all the things that are, everything. You didn't just inherit things. You inherited God. Somebody say, that's pretty good. Okay? So, with that said, I want to talk to you about something that really, really came alive to me just recently. If you're a son, then God will chastise you or correct you. And if you don't endure the chastening of the Lord, you're operating like an illegitimate child or like you don't have a father. But what does that look like? What does it look like when God chases me? I got some examples I'm going to share with you because I, I know exactly what it looks like. First of all, under the old covenant, the chastening was different than it is under the new. Look at 2 Samuel 7, 14. I want to show you this quick. Um, look at 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14, and watch this. This is referring to Solomon, David's son. And God says, I will be his father and he shall be my son. This is under the old covenant, speaking about Solomon. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him, correct him. How will, how will God do this under the old covenant? With the rod of men. See that? And with the stripes of the children of men. Isn't that amazing? Do you know why God said in the new covenant in 1 Corinthians 5, and I believe it's in uh, maybe 2 Timothy 2, 1 Timothy 1, 2 Timothy 2, two times Paul delivered people to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that their spirit would be saved. Do you know why? Because they were rejecting the word. They were going beyond the word, so there was nothing else. God's not going to correct people with destruction, things of Satan. God doesn't do that. Okay? But under the old covenant, God corrected with 
the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. Under the new covenant, I'm going to say this, God corrects you with his word. But how does that look? And why, if God's correcting me with his word, why does it say it's not pleasurable? Isn't the word pleasurable? Has anybody ever thought like this? Okay, okay. All right, let's, let's go look at it. Let's go to, what is, uh, we're going to go to Hebrews 12. Hebrews chapter 12. What is new covenant chastisement? What is new covenant chastisement? That's a, that's a good question. And, and I'm going I'm to give you the definition because I, I, I know it, but I want to read it to you. It, 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 chastisement in the new covenant, under the old covenant, it was the curse. It was physical punishment. They were used under the old covenant. Why? Because men were not born again. Under the new covenant, look at 2 Timothy 3. Well, I'm going to look at this 16 and 17. Watch this. 2 Timothy 3, 16. And then I'm going to give you the Greek definition for chastisement. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. How about verse 15? I like verse 15. Verse 15. And that Paul speaking to, to his protege, Timothy, and he says that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able or empowered to make thee wise unto salvation. The Greek literally says the scriptures have the power to teach divine wisdom. Isn't that good? Why? And through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Next verse. All scripture is given. By the inspiration of God, it's God-breathed, and it's profitable for some things. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, chastisement, for instruction, not for righteousness, but in righteousness. Amen? How many know we need instruction in righteousness? The church has come along and teach instructing people, you do this for righteousness, and that's wrong. Jesus is your righteousness. We were talking about it at our Thursday night uh, Karis Bible study. You don't have to hit a level to witness. You're already in that level. His name is Jesus. Yeah, we're getting more and more understanding, hopefully all the time as we grow in our understanding, but you're not growing and being more righteous with God. You can't be any more righteous than Jesus. As he is, so are you in this world. There is nothing beyond Jesus. Amen? So you're not trying. We got this mindset, well, I got to get to some level. What's that? You're already at the level. It's in Christ. Come on. Amen. You're growing in your understanding of that. But we're waiting on some... We don't even know when it is. How, you know you, how do you know when you're there if you don't even know where... You know, how do I know when if I don't even know what it is? No, it's you're in Christ. Say, I am a vessel ready to flow with the things of God. Amen. All, so it's profitable for doctrine, the scripture, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Next verse, that the man of God may be complete or perfect, thoroughly furnished, completely outfitted unto all good works. You see that? But the word of God, so God uses his word to correct us in the New Testament. And correction, I'm going to give you the definition. We're going to go to Hebrews 12. We'll get at verse 5. Hebrews chapter 12, correction in the New Testament means child training. Pedia, if I pronounce that correctly. It means child training. Child training. You know why? Because God is your father. This is why you can't be a fatherless Job. It's impossible. You have a father. Before we go there, jump over to John 20, 16 and 17. And we'll come back to Hebrews 12, 5. I want you to see this quick. How are we doing on time? Is that one minute or thumbs up? One minute. <laughs> okay, Tim and Green, <laughs> one minute. But guys, this is life changing. If you get this in your heart, it'll change your whole world. But if it's just, I tell people, if you're not hearing by the Spirit of God, then when you hear good preaching, here's what you hear. Charlie Brown's teacher. Whoa, 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 whoa. Turn the Bible to whoa, 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 whoa. This is, oh man, I love it. Jesus saith unto her, this is after his resurrection, Mary, she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say master. Next verse. Jesus saith unto her, this is after his resurrection, before his ascension, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father, to my God and your God. Amen? Amen? God is your father if you're born again. Different than what he said in the old covenant. 
When he said it to Solomon, I will be a father to him. I will act in that role. But in the new covenant, you're in the family. That's why you're an heir of God. <laughs> what more do you need? The Bible says you're complete in Christ, Colossians 2.10. I think it's the living Bible says if you have Jesus, you have everything. Imagine if we believe that. Imagine if we do it and operate out of lack. You know, so many people, even relationally, well, I'm a half person. As soon as I meet Mrs. or Mr. Wright or whatever, then I'm going to be a whole person. You're not a half person. You're a whole person. Amen. So many things we do out of lack, and that's where we get in trouble. You're complete in Christ. You're in the family. God is your inheritance. Oh, glory. Look at that. My father and your father, my God and your God. Now back to Hebrews 12. So what is it, chastisement in the new covenant? Chastisement is the word. It, it, here's what it means. It means the whole, it, uh, the whole training and education of children. The whole training and education of children. That's what it means. In fact, this word here, if you go back to Hebrews 12, 5, no, go to, go to Ephesians and we'll come back. Ephesians 6, 4, I want to show you this quick. When we see ch chastening right there, look at this. And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture, same Greek word for child training, and admonition of the Lord. New covenant, how does God chasten you? This is what we're getting to. If you have a father, God is correcting you. But do you know you can operate like you don't have a father and refuse the correction of the Lord and then pay the price? And say, God, why did you do this? God didn't do it. Amen? This is why it's so important to grow. This is why it's so important to be about the word. Okay, back to Hebrews 12, 5. Watch this. I'm going to focus on verse 8 and verse 11, but I'm going to say some things as we go through this. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. As unto children. Not servants, not churchgoers. As unto children. Now watch this. My son, there it is. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. God corrects you with this word, but what does that look like? Next verse. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, he child changes, he scourges with correction every son whom he receiveth. This is not putting bad things on you as some people teach. Next verse. For if you endure chastening or child training, God's dealing with you as with sons, children, people that are in his family. For what son is he whom the father does not train, nurture, admonish, child train? Next verse. But Now leave this up here. But if you be without... Go to the... I'm going to go to the New King James. Because the B word there is used in a slang term, so I prefer the New King James here. But if you be without chastening or child training, of which all who are born again have become partakers of, then you are, you're operating as illegitimate and not as sons. If God chases me with his word, I'm going to give you some examples. The Lord says, we forgive, not to be forgiven, we forgive because we are forgiven. Ephesians 1, 7, Ephesians 4, 32, and Colossians 3, 13, right? We forgive because we've been forgiven. And I see that, but I don't want to forgive. That doesn't feel good to my flesh. I want to hold a grudge. But I say, Lord, I'm going to endure the chastening or the correction of the Lord. I'm going to go the Word's way, even though I don't feel like it. The Bible says later on in this context, afterwards it yields the peaceable fruits of righteousness. But it's not pleasurable. To what? To my flesh. My flesh don't want to go that way. My flesh wants to get mad. My flesh wants to hold a grudge. My flesh wants to do this and that. But you know what? I'm a son. So I'm going to endure the chastening and the correction and the child training of God's word which says you forgive. Because, not be, to be forgiven, but you forgive because you've already been forgiven. Be kind, tenderhearted one to another. Forgiving one another. Even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Amen. See, but my flesh doesn't want to do that. In fact, we'll come back to verse 8, jump to verse 11. And no chastening, here it is, for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous, a hassle, a pain in the keister. <laughs> it seems to be a drag. I don't like this, right? Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruits of righteousness unto them which are exercised or trained by it. Let me give you, I'm going to give you some examples. Here's a good one. 
Anger. Anger. See, we're talking about the chasing of the Lord. That, it goes right in line with unforgiveness. You want to get angry. You want to blow your top. But what does the Bible say? It talks about when you can refrain your spirit, when you, can, when you can refrain that anger, when you can have a control of that anger, guess what? You, you, you won't say things you regret. Right? And so, so you want to do this. You want to, you want to blow this up. But, but the Word says, you got, all of a sudden God shows you in the Word. He's not, see, God's correction, God's chastening in the New Covenant is never, never rejective, but it's always corrective. God, it's never rejection. If you don't, if you don't uh, endure the chastening of the Lord, he says, but, but God's not going to reject you. But what he's saying is, is you're operating like you don't have a father. Because what father will not correct and nurture his children because he loves them? Amen? See, in the way of righteousness is life. And in that pathway, there is no death. Proverbs 12, 28. Now watch this. So, so, so uh, anger, you want to blow up, but you decide to go the word's way. You decide, to, it doesn't feel pleasurable for the moment. You cast that care over upon the Lord, and guess what? Afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruits of righteousness. Let me give you another one. Worry. We just covered that. People think it's being responsible to worry. Do you know you're tying God's hands? You know, you know what it is? It's pride. We all get attacked with worry. Every one of us. But it's what I do with it. We read it in 1 Peter 5. I'm not going to go back there. Cast it upon the Lord. The word chases me. Why? Because God doesn't want me to operate where the devil can drink me down like water. And so as a son, I recognize I'm a son. I'm going to endure the chastening or the child training of God's word. I'm going to go God's way. And even though my flesh doesn't like it, it's not pleasurable to my flesh for the moment. Afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruits of righteousness with those who have been trained or allow God to train them, child train them with the word of God. Whew, good stuff. High five, Holy Ghost. <laughs> Let me give you another one. Oh, this is a big one. Murmuring. Murmuring. Now, God loves you if you murmur. He does. He's not going to reject you. But the Word says, let, let me see, show you what the Word says. Jump over to 1 Corinthians 10, 9, 10, and 11. Watch this. Watch. And then 1 Corinthians 9, 10, and 11. And then I might do Philippians 2. I'm not sure. Or saith he it altogether for our sakes. For our sakes, no doubt, it is written that... No, no, 10. What did I say? I 10, 9, and 11. That's what I meant. 1 Corinthians 10. That's good, though, too. I saw it in my head, but I said it wrong. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. There we go. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them... Notice he says Christ. As some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Don't do that. Next verse. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Notice they weren't destroyed of God. Notice God didn't reject them. What is this? It's the chastening or the child training of the Lord. He said, don't do that. Don't give a defeated foe an inroad in your life. Amen? Now I have a choice. You know murmuring feels good. I've heard that it releases some chemical in your body that feels good. People like, that's why they like to sit on the bar stool. Yeah, my old lady. Because it feels good. It feels good to their flesh. But what does the Bible say? No chastisement for the moment seems to be pleasurable. It's not fun to tell my flesh no. But afterwards, down the road, it yields the peaceable fruits of righteousness. See, you're not a fatherless Job. You have a father and he corrects you. Aren't you glad he doesn't correct you with the rod of men like they did under the old covenant? Aren't you glad that he corrects you with the word of God? But if I despise the chastening of the Lord, then I reap the consequences. Amen? We're not, it's not being perfect or never making a mistake. If, we, if, if that was the case, God would never chasten us. Because we just do everything the way you know, we do it right. But this is why we need the word, because the word will correct us. What did I say wrong? No, no. No, I, I can't. Go, go back to 1 Corinthians 12. Or no, 9. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 9. I know. That's good. Neither let us tempt Christ to summon them tempt. Guys, this is life and death. I know we're joking, but this is life and death. I'm telling you guys, there's people that will die early because they despise the chastening of the Lord. They'll go home to heaven if they're born again. But they will, they will allow the devil to come in, a defeated foe. They'll go home early. 
And that's not God's plan. God loves you too much. You, to, you know that you have a purpose? You're not here just to exist. Did you know that? You know, if you don't allow God to fulfill the purpose he created you for, somebody will miss out because you didn't, you went home early. That's pretty serious. Amen. I, I mean, I, I know, we're, neither let us tempt Christ. I'll hurry up, guys. As some of them tempted and were destroyed, also tempted and were destroyed of the serpents. Next verse. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Next verse. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So they were written as our examples. Philippians 2, 14 and 15. I'm flying, guys, and we'll be back to Hebrews 12 and we'll wrap it. Uh, what did I say? Uh, Philippians 2, I think it's 14 and 15. Do all things. <laughs> come on. This can't, this has got to be Leviticus. This can't be the new covenant. This ain't the apostle of grace. What's Paul, man? Is he some kind of legalist? He's actually instructing us. He, you know why we're instructed? Because God loves us. Amen. Instruction in righteousness. The correction of the word because God loves us. You know, God does not want us to be re in relational poverty where we can't get along with anybody. So do all things without murmurings and disputings. Next verse. Back, give me that, back up and give me that out of the Amplified if you don't mind. And then go back to... Look, do all things without grumbling and fault finding and complaining against God, questioning and doubting among yourselves. <laughs> all right, now the next verse, King James. That you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God. Wait a minute. Once again, that you may appear that the sons that you are in your position may be a reality in your experience and in your walk. Without rebuke in the midst, here it is, of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Amen. Now, he, quickly, Hebrews 12, 8. We're just about done. I know I got my cue up there. I have to remember that. Whenever you guys start laughing, I think my fly's down. I'm thinking. I start thinking. I go, I'm not feeling any air. I'm just telling you how I think. This scares me, man. That's how we do it. If it's ever down, put flies down. I'll look. But if you be without chastisement or child training, uh, New King James, please. Thank you. But if you be without chast chastening or, or child training of, of which all who are children of God have become partakers, then are you illegitimate and you're not operating as sons because you're not receiving God's correction from the word. You're operating like you're on your own. You're not on your own. God loves you. <laughs> Next verse. You know, if I could do life in my own strength, I wouldn't need the Lord, would I? <laughs> A lot of people think they are and they're deceived. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? Somebody say amen. amen. Next verse. See, he's saying, won't, won't you subject yourself to the Father of spirits, to, to your, your heavenly Father? How do you do that? Through the Word. He doesn't say, well, I know your flesh likes to murmur, so just go ahead. It feels good. That's the problem. You know the old saying, if it feels good, do it? You know how many people that's killed? <laughs> we were talking about it the other day. I got a, got a, you know, you get a lot of interesting messages, but I got somebody, uh, got a hold of my wife and I asked, is it all right to smoke pot? <laughs> and I, I typed back and I said, Jen and I are rolling up a big hooter right now. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't do that. It's a joke. Okay. It's a joke. No, but see, this is what people want. Is it okay to do this? Okay. I said, I said, listen. I said, number one, it's against the law. And number two, it's bad for you. I know a guy who's born again. He's in heaven. But, but it's way worse than cigarettes as far as the intake. It's bad for you. I mean, it's terrible. And it'll cost you. Yeah, so they, but they were wanting, is it, you know, is it, is it okay to do this? And not? People always want it. The very fact that people think, can I do this and not do this? I want to say, what is God telling you? You know it's not right. There's nothing good about it. And you're not doing it for medical purposes. <laughs> I mean, it's just, people know. But my point is, that's what people want. They want, they want a rule. Is it touch not, taste not, handle not? What can I do? What can I do? How much can I get away with? And all that. That's, that whole mindset is messed up. All right, for they indeed for a few days chastened, child trained, corrected us, nurtured us as seemed best to them. 
but he for his profit. No, it's for our profit. Do you see that? God doesn't delight when you and I live in lack in any area. That's not God's desire. In fact, I, was, I can't find it, but I'm still looking. I was, look, I was doing a study on Satan, on the Word. I was devil or Satan. It's been a while ago. And one of the things I found, I think it was in uh, uh, classical Greek or something, that one of his names means lack. Or has, to deal with, has to do with lack. The devil's, a, 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 you know, he's into lack and people suffering. Amen. <laughs> but God is not. For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he does this. God does it. In other words, our, our earthly fathers corrected us because they wanted to make themselves look good. Amen? Stop it, Johnny. You're making me look bad. But God doesn't do it for that. He does it for our benefit. And I'm not saying earthly fathers don't do it for your benefit too, but they want to look good too, all right? But he's saying this is so much better. God's doing it for your benefit, and he does it with the word, and I gave you some examples. But he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Next verse. For no chastening, child training, seems to be joyous at the present moment, but painful. In other words, we're resisting some, our flesh wants to throw a fit and go its own way, but, but nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of being righteous with God to those have been, who have been trained by it, to those who allow the word to train them. Afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. So on this Father's Day, I just want you to know you're not a fatherless Job. You have a father, and he corrects you with his word because he loves you. Now I turn I'll tell you what, we got some comedians back there. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. Amen. So there's a lot more we could say, but I wanted, I wanted to give you those seven things that you can't be a Job because of that. And then I wanted, to, I wanted to stay on the chastening because a lot of people don't understand chastening in the New Covenant. It's completely different. In fact, I can just tell you this. There's some of our political leaders, they want to quote things from the Bible, but they always quote from the Old Testament. We're not under that covenant. We're not under that covenant, guys. Do you know why they stoned a rebellious son? Anybody know under the Old Covenant? They did that. You know that. You know why? Because it was demonic. And, and they couldn't get delivered under the Old Covenant like we can under the New. So a rebellious son or daughter is demonic. That's why. That's why when they would go in and they would destroy whole cities, you know why? Because it was demonic. It's like when, you, when a limb is ampu amputated. Why? Is it because you hate that hand? No, it's because if you don't deal with that infected limb, it will infect the whole body. <clears throat> See, it was a completely different covenant. And because man wasn't born again, how many know we are? How many know we have the Holy Spirit? How many know God is our Father? Amen. Say, I am not a fatherless Job. I have a Father. God is my Father. Now, if you said that and you're not born again, God is not your Father.